Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges as he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Well, Paul, here I sit back three weeks from a northern trip of on northern Europe on a cruise and a few days in Cambridge, England. And you know how much I love to travel, except I got home last night and I am still on English time, and I must say I have a bit of jet lag fatigue. But I promised our most special guest my very best, which won't be difficult at all because she is such a tremendous guest. So much fun. In my opinion, our guest today, Suzanne Campy, ranks as a premier personal life coach for those of you looking for wisdom in life's most challenging transitions. Today's show is all about making wise decisions and wise choices in a puzzling world as we deal with what Suzanne calls the miraculous middle days of our life. Now, just a note, to tell you about Suzanne, all of you regular listeners know that I spend about an hour with each guest prior to the show to discuss topics. Now, I have to admit that my discussion with Suzanne today earlier was a failure because she was so good, she was personally coaching me, and I almost forgot to talk to her about what she wants to do on the show. But sure, she is so good that we won't worry about it. Suzanne's gifts are will be obvious. She listens intently, she is rapaciously curious and fully present, offering keen wisdom. With that, let's welcome our special guest on the show, Suzanne Campy. Welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Oh, thank you, Charlie Hedges. What a beautiful, wow. Can I copy that down? Thank you so much for that introduction. (laughs) It's so true. That was my feeling. That was the the feeling I had from our discussion today. You were brilliant. Oh, yes. I felt an instant bond with you, Charlie. That was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. There's so many topics that we can discuss today because your what you bring to the table, your resume, there's so many things, but three particular items incited a lot of energy in me, and that was the nature of life's normal transitions, your idea of what you call the miraculous middle, and of course the role of the wise elder in today's culture. But before we get deep into transitions and wisdom, I'm curious, will you tell us about your coaching practice and the kinds of people most attracted to your services? I have a fabulous group of clients, and I would say most of them are going through a change, but I have to admit most people are no matter what, whether they reach out for a coach or not. The nice thing about reaching out for that coach is that people get that support. And I always say I like to lock arms and lock elbows with my clients and march forward and hold up a mirror for them when they need it. I can remind them of their greatness, of their strength, of their uniqueness. And I always like to say fabulousness. That's my new word. My people are going through many a change, and it's really the whole gamut. Somebody who, uh, for, for instance, some of them have health challenges, so have to change up a career. I was a, re- I was a recruiter for many years. Excuse me, I have an alarm going off. I was a recruiter for many years, so people come to me with job changes, with career changes. And this is fun because Reinventing who you are before you step into what you're looking for is always a big part of that. In any change, Charlie, in any transition in life, whether it's career, whether it's being married, having a child, losing a marriage, losing a spouse, there's so many big changes, some that we choose, some that we don't choose. Because there's really a chance to step back and take a look at who do I want to be? Who who do I think I can be now? Who do I want to be now? Maybe I'll change this up. Do you find, what do you find more common? 
that when somebody's saying a career change, that they want to fall back into old patterns, or do they see the opportunity that I can change, I can do something different, I can align with my passions more, which seems to be more common? Mm, I think people start out with taking a look and really looking at um, possibility and the hope for the thing that they really want to do next time. Mm. And then when it, what I also find is if they don't find it right away, they tend to give up a little too quickly. And that can be driven by fear, and that can be driven by the fact they need a paycheck, right? But often people are very hopeful, and we can get them there where they are fulfilling their heart and their soul's purpose in their next journey. Do you so it's th- a possibility, but it takes patience and work sometimes. Absolutely. Do you think is it possible that people have the fear of running out of money too soon there's a fear that they're they're so used to having maybe some money stashed away or a little bit of savings that they don't want to compromise that that they could wait another month or two or three but they're so reluctant and so fearful of not having the resources to live at the lifestyle they're familiar with everybody's different and there's times I don't know what people discuss their fear with income and and with their savings and I don't know what their nest egg is not really sure what you're asking me there Charlie I just Um, I I was wondering if money sometimes I think we can be so fearful you know in our capitalistic framework and that we have to have mm -hmm. so much that we're so we get fearful of money perhaps a little bit too quickly that Yes, that, I hear what you're saying. Yes, a little too, a little over paranoid about it. Yes. 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 But and then, they're, you know, if they're projecting out and thinking, if I'm doing this for six months, that's that, this many dollars out of my savings. If I'm doing it, you know, figuring this out for a year, projecting that amount scares the heck out of them. Picking up and being real about that and facing it for what it's really worth it can be part of what we talk about. I was I was just on a cruise and it was on a it was a nice it's a very nice cruise line. And there was a woman who was on the cruise, believe this or not, for one year. She was going to be on this particular ship and she never disembarked. She just she lived in Honolulu. She said, My life is boring. She was eighty years old. And she said, I have a little bit of money, not a whole lot. She had enough money that she could spend a year on a ship. And she said, I decided that I have no no children, no one that I need to give my money to, that I just, I'm going to spend my money. I'm not going to be. And she said, I not only want to die broke, I want to die with my last check bouncing and, and good for her oh my god isn't that cool that's so cool and it's quite unusual isn't it yeah that it's i've said it for forever it's now my wife is the conservative i'm conservative but i like to have fun and i said i don't want to die broke i want to die owing money my oh, my son is a professional baseball player so he doesn't need my money so let's get into let's get into the transitions i think that's a big era of life now. We're seeing baby boomers in transitions. I was an early baby boomer born in 1949. So I started going through transitions sooner than many people. And there's a bulk going through now. But then transitions are not just about retirement, are they? There's right. We're going through transitions our entire life from the minute from 25 years old. We're dealing with transitions and it's something we're not taught. We're not educated on how to manage transitions. Just so true. That should be a few classes in high school, shouldn't it? It should. It really should. People tend to freak out at change, don't they? We hate limbo, and change involves some sort of limbo, right? When, we, when, we, when I talk about, just to back up, when I talk about transitions, I do take my work from William Bridges, and there's three stages of the transition and the first Mm. one being 
first one being the end of something, right? You don't transition to something new without ending something. That's one thing if you take, for instance, shoot, grieving a lot, loss of a loved one. There's a right. big ending. Right. But, and we tend to not want to take that, take a look too hard at that ending. We want to just rush on to the next thing. There's a lot more to be processed there. First of all, with an ending, say a death, uh, we don't ritualize in our country very well anymore. Do we? we may oh. have a funeral in three days or a celebration of life in a week. Then everybody's supposed to go back to work and and live as usual and hold their chin up and go, ludicrous. Right? It's ludicrous. But I will never forget when my dad died. I started getting emails out and I said, my dad died. Oh, okay. See you next week. How was it? Sorry. See you next week. That was all I got. You're just supposed to move through it. And that is not healthy because as we know, if we don't grieve and if we don't honor, that will come and come to bite us in the butt. We can stuff it as long as we try and stuff it, but it's going to come and get us. It's going to come and get us when we least expect it. First, we honor that ending. And let's say it's not as much as grief, but it's uh, being empty nested or retiring, really honoring what that thing was that we just left. If you're empty nested, how about patting yourself on the back for using children? <laughs> yes. Giving yourself yes. some real honor and love for it. And I say with a solid career, as somebody who's been working for 45 years, my goodness yourself a thank you letter honor yourself for all those sacrifices for everything that went on in those 40 years for the people whose lives you touched and the love you distributed and and and, oh, and, and how you helped people's lives and people don't tend to do that you no. tend to race on through Next, what am i going to do go on a cruise blah, 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 blah. and so honoring that piece and if we could bring ritual back in the united states it would be oh. beautiful and maybe we can do it maybe we can start charlie are having ritual ceremonies. My my best friend recently lost her, and I had been hearing about this, you know, death ritual and whatnot. So we three her three besties took her away, and we just surrounded her with love and waited on her and let her wail for three days. And oh. I just thought that was really cool. I've done it. I've done it kind of not of a deep dive, but I've done a dive into death rituals. And we had a show maybe a month and a half ago. That's called, I believe we called it the presence of death. And it was with this guy who is a, he does funerals, but he's hospice, but he calls himself a death doula. Oh, and, yeah, that's a thing now. Yeah. And have you mm -hmm. heard of death cafes? No. There are death cafes all over the world where you sit and talk. There's certain rules about what you talk about. But you talk about the loss of a loved one and the death, mm -hmm. and they're really profound. They're very strong. And not that we have to be talking about death, but about the ritualizing of it. And I'm a big ritual mm -hmm. person, and I think rituals are essential. And that, that really does ease transition. As you're talking mm -hmm. about ends are difficult, I'm always taken to T.S. Eliot. And a poem out of his Four Quartets, it's called Little Gettings. And he writes in his poem that every end is a beginning and every beginning is an end. It's just a constant <laughs> cycles of ends and beginnings. Right. And, and the more we can embrace that, the better off we are. So true. And normalize it and realize we're not the only ones and seek help, seek support. That's where, that's where I come in this work. After we do talk about honoring that ending, and that can take a while. I can work with people for weeks or months on that if they so choose. We move into the whole generative piece, which is middle, which William Bridges called the messy middle, and I like to call the miraculous middle. I like that. The whole that. middle of that process is so generative, so much going on. And as long as I, sometimes people are sad if they've lost somebody or if they've lost a job or, and they're sad and sometimes they don't want to move. And that's got to be honored too. Sometimes you just need to lay on the couch for a day or two or a month. But stepping forward, especially when looking for a job or that kind of thing, any little act is a step forward or a zig or a zag. I always call it running in a zigzag fashion. Yeah. You may yeah. even slip. As my mom used to say, take a step forward and two steps back. That might happen too. Yeah. 
but yeah. every every inch of the way you're learning something, you're gleaning something, new insights, something. And if you're in the ca- case of a job search, if you're not finding what you want. You might be doing well finding what you don't want, and that's learning too. Tremendous. So that miraculous middle can go on forever. And the middle doesn't mean the middle of life, like a midlife. It's the middle of the transition. Exactly. Exactly. So looking at that transition in three stages, then you lead eventually to a new beginning. But like you said, a new beginning isn't a beginning and it, it can go on for a long time. As in the case of, again, mourning never i never stop mourning my mom and dad i will never stop it changes over time it morphs but i can't say i hit a place where oh i've got a new beginning and i don't mourn them anymore yeah you don't, don't miss it dishonor you know, that it's missing cool. them it's missing them yeah my dad was 93 he he had lost his mom when he was 22 or 23 and he could still talked about her he still got tears and i thought oh that was like my biggest message in mourning. Never over your parents. Never over who you've lost. You just simply get a little more used to it. Yes, and some it's more difficult for some than others. That's that's a I have this I have this theory that say you and I were closer and you and I have a friendship and there is you and there is me and it's my contributions and receptions to the friendship, your contributions and receptions to the friendship. But as that de- friendship develops, there's a third entity. There is the entity of the friendship that mm-hmm. is separate from both of us, but it's mm-hmm. extant. It is real. And that's why I feel that after death, that a person, the the body may die but the essence of that relationship never dies. That mm. is always there. That is always that third entity that is just crystal clear. And mm. that has helped me a lot. That's beautiful. Love that, Charlie. And that can also continue to feed you, huh? Oh, yes, absolutely. You definitely continue to feed your soul and keep them closer. You know what I want to do right now is I want to take a break because I want to come to, I want to focus a lot on being selfish on my old age stuff that I think brings a lot to the table that you have. You're not as old as I am, but you have much wisdom that you can, you can bring to the table. So let's take a quick break and we'll come back. All right. Hi there, this is Charlie Hedges, and you are listening to the next chapter with Charlie and my very special guest, Suzanne Campy. And we are talking about the issue of transitions and that life is nothing if it is not transitions, that you are always moving from one stage to another stage. And if you're not, you're living a pretty damn boring life. And in <laughs> I think in denial, I think because you are growing one way or another, you are not stagnating and so you're growing downward. But we're talking about growing upward. And one thing that Suzanne and I really agree on, and that is the idea that the older we get, the wiser we get. Suzanne, do you know when, how old I was when I said, I have incipient, the very beginning of wisdom, the very beginning. I felt that I had enough, I'd had enough experience. I, how old, how young would you guess I would have been? You personally? Yes. Oh boy. You're a humble man. I think you would have waited and thought it when you were 65. No, I was 35. Wow. And I felt it. There was something about it that I felt 
This is not a typical knee-jerk, logical decision. This is coming otherworldly almost. This is coming from a, a depth as deep as you can be at 35. And you can be, every year you are deep. You, because you don't know what true depth is, so that's as deep as you can go. And so you feel deep, do you not? By 35 or 40, you feel I'm a pretty deep thinker. And that's just because you haven't had enough going on. I think you, and I, you had mentioned something about that, that a lot of people don't know what wisdom is or don't have wisdom because they really don't know what it is. They've not experienced it. I think I was saying they don't respect it or honor it because they don't know what it is. Yes, that was it. You can't was... know it if you haven't had it. And, it's like and saying you'd know what labor was like. What is the process? Is it a reflective process? Is it, it, it seems to be something that one must ponder. It, or does it come just intuitively and all of a sudden you seem to be saying things that you're just saying, where did that come from? You know where I go to with that, Charlie? I go to learning from your mistakes. <laughs> Feel, there's a certain amount of introspection has to happen, right? Have to understand you've made mistakes and are learning from them. You've made successes and have learned from them. Probably the more mistakes, more wise, more knockdowns. That's where big lessons come from. One wouldn't know if one didn't have some kind of self-reflection, self-realization. I agree, yet at the same time, I have learned from successes. I have grown, I have gained wisdom from successes of oh, yeah. things. You, mm -hmm. the, the failures are more, more acute, more prominent. You, you feel them more deeply. Maybe you have mm -hmm. to ponder the successes a little bit differently. Right. You know, really learn from both of them. Richard Rohr, I think you had mentioned that, that you know him. He's, the, um, mm -hmm. he's quite open about that he's dying. He's 81 or 82. He has four cancers that he's battling, and he's been supposed to die for the last four years, and his body refuses to do. And he is he's a Franciscan priest, that's more Franciscan than he is Catholic priest, although he is a Roman Catholic priest, but he's mm -hmm. more Franciscan. And there's, um, what is it called? Not unorthodox theology. It's some kind of orthodoxy. It's, uh, I can't remember. It's, but it's not official orthodoxy. And, and he views life very differently. And he wrote a book in 2011 titled Falling Upward. And falling upward is about two halves of life. The first half of life and is building the ego, and which is really nice to read from the mystical, contemplative sort of religious aspect that is so against ego. And he says, ego is essential. You must have a full understanding of yourself, a grounding of yourself, an understanding of who you are, until you hit second half of life, and second half of life is 50, 60, 70. For me, it was probably around 50, 65 to 70. And it just occurs to you, because of years, that the ego life, my ego, who I am, how I define myself, doesn't matter. It, mm. it, it mattered at the time, but it doesn't matter now. And he says, that's when you enter into a second half, and he calls it the ruler phase, which I am not comfortable with, but I call it the elder phase. It's a whole different way of viewing things. And this is where I see a conflation of a lot of things. I see a conflation of a big Myers-Briggs person and extrovert, introvert, intuitive, sensor, thinker, mm -hmm. feeler, perceiver, judger that I am what's called an INTP, an introverted, intuitive thinker that is flaky, that is spontaneous, <laughs> impulsive. As I grow older, I find them coming together. 
and that oh. I am really in the middle, that I my feelings are coming forth really strongly. And I am becoming, oddly enough, in my older age, I'm becoming more extroverted than I was in the past. And I found that with the Enneagram the same way. Do you see, as you're growing older in this elder phase, the lack of compartmentalism and the more of a holistic approach to life? Yes, I see what you're saying. Very much, very much. Things just get, I don't want to say easier, we're a little more clear. I feel like when you talk about letting go of the ego, of course we can't let go of the ego. We can see when it's rearing its ugly head in an unhealthy way. Mm-hmm. Because we are more aware of ourselves. And that's why people, I think there's to the say that like the happiest decade now is the 70s and above. There's actual studies. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, really? So, so it's not just me forward. thinking it. There's actually yeah. research to validate think it. it. You quit giving a damn what everybody thinks. That really helps. Oh, my gosh. Isn't We're that so wrapped true? Up. Uh, so wrapped up in what other people think of or think about us or who cares <laughs> and it's beautiful not to care and that gets and then it almost gets dangerous but this self-awareness of what's and then when all reality we would not to bring up the topic again but we've watched a lot of people friends and peers and stuff pass away and see people cut out of life all of a sudden when they didn't know it was happening and it just become life gets so precious. It's so precious. Isn't it Bonnie Raitt's song that said, Life gets mighty precious when there's less of it to waste? Oh, I don't know that. that what a wonderful title. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. He just, I, I think, comes less compartmentalization, compartmentalization comes from us really getting down to what's most important. So many things that we have kvetched about our whole life just don't matter. <laughs> And that becomes much more clear the older you get. Oh, I like the use of the Yiddish, kvetched. <laughs> Sometimes there's only a Yiddish word for it. <laughs> Isn't it true? Now, when we were talking, you said one of your one of your gifts in coaching is that you were present. And so to be present is very much what we're talking about now. It is, it is, it is mm-hmm. not thinking so much of the future, not thinking of the past, but just fully embracing and in, in, engaging in what's going on. What is your secret to living in the present? It's a practice. I think I came aware of living in the practice, probably in the practice, in the present, probably 25 years ago when I picked up an echo. Really? It's not that I always do it. It's not that I always do any of my practices. But I, I like to say life is a practice. Um, It's something to, it's a mindfulness practice. If we are mindful and present and aware of such things, I forget what your question specifically was. No, it's just, what is your secret to being present? Mm, I think curiosity with people. and Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds cliche, but I truly love people. And when I engage with them from get go, they are my they're my person i feel very vested in them if they're my client want them happy in a tremendous way i want them to succeed and i'm going to see their greatness and like i said uniqueness and fabulousness when they don't so i'm there to remind them we'll see it it's in everybody we are all we've all got it we've all got something really cool to offer we're Sounds... forgetting who we are for a moment. So we just forget and we have to be brought back. It sounds very compassionate, very empathetic that that mm. the other person, there is value in that other person. And there is value not just existentially, but there's value in that present moment. What you're bringing to the table, what you're talking mm-hmm. about now, who you are and what you're being there is value to that. And I think that requires compassion and empathy. You know what the biggest, my biggest compassionate practices is compassion for myself. That's where I fall off. 
that's where I fall out of practice most often. And I can't be compassionate with other people unless I'm compassionate with myself. That is what I work my absolute hardest at, being aware of, being and living into my self-compassion. I can pick myself apart. There's nobody's business. Uh, aren't and that we doesn't all... serve anybody. It doesn't serve anybody in my life. That doesn't serve my clients. That is my biggest. That and that be... that really goes back to childhood, doesn't it? I don't want to be the one to say, "Oh, it's my parents' fault. My parents did this." But it's very parental. It's also mm-hmm. very American education. That American mm-hmm. education is very rule following and acceptance and it's very religious religion i did compared phases of human growth with phases of spiritual growth and there's childhood there's adolescence no there's infancy adolescence childhood young adulthood and mature adulthood and the church doesn't like her congregation to move beyond childhood because if they move to adolescence, they're thinking. They're thinking outside mm-hmm. the box. They're not accepting everything. And the church, now it depends on the church you're going to, but I'm talking to the church at large, dissuades people from being, from thinking differently. And then the whole thing comes up of adolescence and in fact these kids are gonna have a sex life and that freaks them out. And then the kids are just shamed for that. I was raised 12 years in Catholic schools, Charlie. <laughs> in a girls' school or in a co-ed school? Uh, high school was all girls. So there wasn't, no, there wasn't a lot of t- teachings on self-compassion. There still are. To say the, to say the least. What were you going to say? That's Elaine, but De, De Button has a, 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 a world institution called the School of Life. And Mm -hmm. they say his motto is we teach people reading, writing, and arithmetic, but we don't teach them how to feel and how to deal with emotions. And that's what he's, that's what his effort is teaching about, is teaching about that. We also don't teach wisdom. And then just another thing, just a side little pet peeve, we don't teach kids how to budget. I was going to say, I was going to throw that in there. (laughs) It's just, just ridiculous. The, the essences of life, we don't teach them. That's, um, now back on the transition, I wanted to get, I wanted to talk, and, let's, and I want to wrap up our time together, and I want to talk about what you had said, and I'm interested in the stats of the 70s and 80s. In the 70s, there's no way I turned 75 this year, and there's no way I would have anticipated the learning, the wisdom, the calmness, the acceptance, just the beauty of turning 70 and, and turning or, or experiencing my, my eighth decade is just so delightful. It is just so wonderful. I don't, I don't feel old and decrepit. Fortunately, I don't have any health issues, major health issues. So my wife and I, neither one, so we can pretty much do what we want to do, but it's a grand decade. And it's, I hope there's more written on it or talked about it. It's a, it's a secret to us early baby boomers. We keep, baby boomers have paved the path in so many ways, in so many good ways, I'd like to say. And uh, one of them, becoming the hippies in the 60s and breaking the status quo and women gaining strength and power yeah. and we and bank accounts and credit card account and ridiculous feelings we had to pick through. Thank you to the women of the so much of the sixties, seventies and onward. And we now are breaking the mold as it goes into quote unquote retirement age. And now we're not we're saying what? Tire. We're just looking at our next act. It, it, it is. Are. We're just growing into something new. We're not in an easy chair. We're breaking that mold now, too. Now, without the 60s being taboo, maybe that's why you're allowed to see now that, wow, this is pretty cool. I don't think my parents were in love with being older. But isn't it true, though, Suzanne, that 
they were older. Look at them from when you're twenties. They looked mm-hmm. old. They felt old. They they moved old. They mm-hmm. had a hard time getting off the couch. And my wife plays tennis twice a week, Pilates three days a week, and that would have been unheard of for my mom. That would have been yeah, just. It was unfeminine for women to sweat back on my. It, <laughs> there were so many barriers to break. <laughs> Yeah, that is. You know, that's not ladylike. I don't want to sweat. Yeah, we are doing it so differently. And once again, I think we deserve a little credit <laughs> oh, for yeah. being cool. You know what I just did? Uh, this most simple, uh, simple, simple Google tr- Google search. I wrote statistics on happiness in each decade, thinking I was probably blowing, could have been blowing smoke on this. That may have been some obscure study that somebody from Stanford pulled. No. First thing, the researchers found people reached their happiness when they arrived at the age of 70. You do not. It's the first Google search. World's Happiness Report. That Can you repeat so, that for me? <laughs> sure. The researchers found people reached their happiest when they arrived at the age of 70. Life satisfaction decreased between the ages of 9 and 16, <laughs> increased a little until the age of 70. They're saying it kept going up and up until 70. I've read differently. And then declined again until the age. No, that's not true. Okay. We'll, f- we'll find a, a better one. I no longer work. I no longer make money. I'm a kept man. My wife makes a boatload <laughs> of money, so I'm, I pride myself on being a kept man. But I work for two charities. One, I was vice president of operations in Uganda. We go to Uganda two to three times a year. Another one that I'm working with now where I working strategically on finding a new CEO of a significant charity. So I'm doing all these things that I did in business, but you you, you know the big difference, Suzanne, is I'm not doing it with the purpose of making money, and I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm doing it because I select doing it. It is this is what I want to do. This is a selection and that is a privilege. Not everybody my age can do that. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of people living on Social Security that haven't had the opportunity to, to save well. But it is just a joyous time. And it can be a joyous time. That's beautiful. You're a model baby boomer retired person. To be, giving, <laughs> to be giving back the way you are and to be leaving the legacy that you are. That is beautiful. And that's why you're satisfied. <laughs> that is true. I've got a final question for you before we close out, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's it's my question to my cradle Catholic. Suzanne, tell me, how do you see the relationship between your work in life transition and personal spirituality? Boy, they are not separated. We are one. <laughs> I'm one with my spirituality, and that is pure love. You're honoring, you're understanding that we are all one, that we are all love. It's that simple. I tell you, you are a, you don't know it yet, but you are a contemplative mystic. That is the heart of the mystics. Suzanne Campy, it it has been such a delight chatting with you. You have been such a delight, Charlie. What a fun new friend I have. Likewise. I like that, a new friend. That's a nice way to put it. I like that. Thank you for spending time with me. Thank you so much. Lovely. Thank you, Paul. I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And remember, you can always find more blogs and podcasts at our website, thenextchapter.life, L-I-F-E. And so until next... This is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.